So uh, thanks, first of all, uh, for being here at CSC conference. It's our first time participating uh, in the conference, but I think the, the idea that drives the conference resonates a lot with our own mission um, and also seeing a lot of familiar faces and, and names. So very excited and grateful to, to be here with you all. Um, and also excited to catch the, the Kama Lama that I did not get to catch yesterday. Um, so as an introduction, um, I'm Krista Hazenkope. I'm with OpenAQ. We are a nonprofit based in Washington, DC, uh, and our mission is to fight air inequality with open data and community. Um, and uh, air inequality, if you have not heard of it before, is a, a term our community has coined to express the severe human rights and public health issue that uh, the lack of uh, clean air to breathe across the world poses to, to all of us. Um, and so uh, in this talk, I'm gonna cover a few points. I'll talk a little bit about OpenAQ's motivation in our mission. I'll introduce the OpenAQ platform. Uh, I'll share a few cool uses of the platform in our community, and I'll highlight two particular use cases involving COVID-19 and air quality. Uh, and then share what's next for our community and how to get involved if you're interested. Um, I'll also hopefully end uh, a couple minutes early to take questions, but if I don't, uh, please do uh, post any questions in the uh, conference's Q&A Slack channel and I will definitely answer there. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, air inequality is a huge issue. Uh, it's really one of the biggest public health and human rights issues of our time. Uh, air pollution in general, indoor and outdoor air pollution causes one out of every eight deaths on the planet. Uh, it's a huge issue. And one of the things we've noticed in community after community is uh, a basic issue to tackling air pollution at the local level is access, basic access to, to air quality data. Um, and when that access is enabled, uh, a community can, can tackle, uh, begin tackling the issue. And so um, a great example of this that we've seen uh, was in Beijing about 10 years ago. Um, about 10 years ago, the U.S. Embassy in, in Beijing uh, launched a little air quality monitor on its rooftop that started sharing out air quality data via Twitter. Uh, soon, third-party apps started uh, scraping that data, and suddenly millions of Beijingers for the first time were walking around with air quality information um, on their phone that they could see in real time. Uh, this created a huge stir uh, and actually caused a series of, of um, actions uh, from the Chinese government that uh, improved uh, open access to air quality data uh, and also initiated many different um, policies, air pollution policies, both in Beijing and across the country uh, in terms of monitoring, but also mitigation uh, of pollution. And um, air pollution is still clearly uh, a huge issue uh, in, in China and in Beijing but it has significantly improved year on year for the past about four or five years. And you really can trace a lot of that progress to the initial stir that was caused by this little bit of open data. Um, and so what we have found in the OpenAQ community across the world are other examples as well, where um, that basically when you open up this access to, to data that uh, communities can affect policy change. And so what we see as the challenges uh, in many different locations is there's a lack of access to air quality data, often in the most polluted places, uh, and that when data is shared, it's often um, across many fields besides air pollution, but often shared in an inconsistent uh, format uh, from place to place or a format that's temporary. So on a say, government website, air quality information is shared on an hourly basis and it gets updated and that data is lost for easy access after that data has appeared. Um, and these, these factors present, prevent civil society from taking um, action to improve their air quality in their local community. And so that's where our mission comes in. We have a very simple mission, which is to um, aggregate and harmonize uh, existing disparate air quality data, largely from government sources currently, uh, to put it into one format and make that data available in the ways that enable a larger public audience to, to use that data in, in the ways that their expertise um, best suits. And so essentially extracting more value, more impact from, from that data. Uh, so this can be data uses, uh, including uh, you know, app development, education, public health analysis, uh, other scientific use cases, policy work, uh, a wide array of, of activities. And so the idea behind this is that uh, the platform, oops, sorry, 
The platform harmonizes this disparate air quality data, uh, it enables the convening diverse sectors to improve the coordination around uh, uh, building solutions. And in general, you're creating a healthier and more efficient data sharing ecosystem, which really positions the civil society to better fight air inequality in uh, local regions and across the world. So to briefly introduce the OpenAQ platform, uh, so if you go to openaq.org, you'll see a world map of uh, data from across the world uh, and at various locations uh, from currently 93 countries. Uh, this data is also accessible for download on the, the platform. Uh, everything you see on, on the website and in our platform is open source and it's been created by an open source community. I link here uh, to our, our GitHub page with the different uh, repositories of, of our, our platform's code. And the data is made available in a few different ways. One is through uh, the website I showed, but also through uh, an open uh, API and there's a link to the, the docs. Uh, there, uh, this is the same API that powers the website and anything that's built on top of our, our platform by ourselves. Um, and then there's also, so this, the API and the website provide the past 90 days worth of data. So you can also access that data via uh, S3 buckets uh, on AWS. So we see quite a bit of uh, usage of, of data from the platform. Uh, we see on average about 33 million data requests per month to, to the platform. So this equates to about 400 million data requests per year. Uh, and these come from all over the world. I will say there is a, a, a larger amount of data usage in the places from, from the places where there is existing data. So where you see data gaps, um, you, you see less usage, which makes total sense and speaks to the need of uh, uh, generating more data in places uh, with currently without any. And so, as I mentioned, our, our platform was really uh, created and is still uh, in large part contributed uh, by an open source community who also use uh, the data. So, uh, for example, an open source contributor in our community uh, from Mongolia, a software developer, Dolgun, uh, wrote a code uh, for to access data uh, in Bosnia because there was a small group in Tuzla, Bosnia, who were recording data by hand from a website Dolgun heard about this, he wrote the adapter that got um, added to our system, and then this group can now access that data much, much more easily than they were before. Or another example is uh, a Swedish uh, app developer wanted to ingest Swedish air quality information into his app, um, contacted uh, the Swedish Environmental uh, Administration to adjust their API to uh, provide all of the, the data and metadata that our system requires so that the data could be ingested. Um, and as I mentioned, and I'll give a few examples of other community uses of the data, but uh, there's been one popular example is uh, Smokey the Air Quality Bot Owl on, on Twitter and Facebook and on airpollution.io created by uh, a developer who was based in Delhi, India at the time. And it really takes the information that's shared on our platform, the, the raw information and helps present it in a very um, uh, human way, in a way that connects with the public in more ways. And so we uh, use the really the gravity of this massive data set to convene local communities across sectors, and we've done this in cities across the world. Um, in fact, David, uh, the first speaker in this session, uh, was a participant in uh, the workshop we held in Accra, Ghana. Um, and the idea of these workshops is to get folks from across different sectors in a local area uh, where there's an air inequality issue and find the low-hanging fruit that everyone can get behind uh, to take an action. So. For instance, in Sarajevo, Bosnia, uh, the group, the participants there uh, decided that while there was a lot of open air quality data, what was lacking was uh, a, an understanding of how much pollution was coming from which sources. So uh, the group, uh, which comprised uh, uh, folks from a think tank, uh, some scientists who could do the research, uh, some air quality agency staff, uh, they came together and decided to launch a field campaign on figuring out just that, how much pollution was coming from which sources in Sarajevo for the first time. Um, and they are just wrapping up that the work of that project uh, now. So I'll mention a few community uses uh, of, of the data uh, that we have seen over the past few years. Um, and also briefly mention that uh, who our community is. So we conducted a survey a couple uh, months ago uh, to, to um, figure out who is in the community. And you can see um, it's quite diverse. 
several different countries, but you do still see the uh, uh, the, the domination of, of the community being uh, focused on where there is a, a lot of access to air quality data already. Um, and again, points to this, this data access gap uh, where there's simply no data to, to really ingest publicly. Um, so one use case that we've seen uh, from the research community is uh, using the air quality data to um, inform air quality forecasts. So a team at NASA, for example, uh, they have a, a atmospheric chemistry model of air quality at the city level for various places around the world, and they can test how well their model works by taking the observation data they access from the OpenAQ platform in, in near real time uh, to, assess, to assess their model. Another example is the media. So uh, data-driven journalists can access the information and make data visualizations that are relevant to their region or the world in this case. So uh, Bloomberg News recently launched um, uh, Bloomberg Green. And one of the pieces of that has been this air pollution visualization that shows air quality across the world. And they ingest data from uh, the OpenAQ API to, to do that. Uh, another example, this is not so much a data use case, but uh, an example of how governments can be incentivized to open up data once you have uh, a massive set of harmonized data in one place, is we were recently contacted by uh, the Icelandic Environmental Agency uh, to help them uh, build their API in a way that uh, would let their data be shared onto OpenAQ, which was, which, which was awesome. So now that data uh, appears on, on OpenAQ. And again, I think it speaks to the fact that if you do have data in one place in a harmonized fashion, it can um, it get more data. So data can be get more data and incentivize governments to, to uh, open their data in a fully harmonizable fashion. So I did wanna highlight a couple examples we've seen from our community recently around COVID-19 and air quality. Uh, you, you may have seen some articles in the news around air quality uh, and how it's been changing with COVID-19 lockdowns and, and uh, what this can, can mean. Uh, so one example we've seen from our community comes from India, uh, from Shrat Gudakunda at Urban Emissions. It's done a fantastic series of analyses. I have a link there to, to the article. I can also post that in the Slack channel uh, that shows um, uh, an analysis of what air pollution, specifically in this case shown here, nitrogen dioxide is, was doing before and then during the onset of the lockdown period in Delhi. Uh, nitrogen dioxide uh, is a pollutant that uh, is associated with transportation cars. Um, and you can see a pretty marked decrease uh, uh, after the lockdown period. And so the reason Sharat's able to do this sort of analysis is because the data is available in a near real time fashion and also um, in, in one harmonized place. And he's done this analysis for various pollutants uh, in various cities across, across India. A, a really interesting um, preliminary analysis that's been done globally comes from this Norwegian group where they took satellite data and they also accessed data from the OpenAQ platform uh, for 27 countries and did a, a more global analysis of the impact of lockdowns across the world. So they looked at the two week period after uh, a lockdown uh, and compared that to air, uh, the air quality previous to that period. They also controlled for meteorology and other conditions that could be changing during this time. Um, and they found uh, over all pollutants and over the 27 countries, they looked at a 20% decline on average uh, of pollution. And then they went a step further and linked that to uh, some human health impacts as well. And what we can glean from this is sort of a silver lining to, to um, the, the COVID-19 lockdowns for, for air quality policy going forward. Um, and so there's a link uh, there to the preprint. I know it's small. Again, I can share it on the Q&A Slack channel if anyone is is interested. But again, the, 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 the reason this preliminary analysis could be done in such a timely manner is because the data is available programmatically and in a harmonized fashion um, so that the people who want to do such an analysis can get to doing what they do um, as quickly as possible and apply their, their expertise instead of wrangle data. So if you'd like to hear uh, briefly what's next for the OpenAQ community and how to get involved, that's how we'll end this out. So what's next for us? We are really excited to be expanding our platform and really launching a pilot platform that will include low cost air quality sensing uh, in our system. Right now we primarily uh, share government and some research grade air quality data. Um, and one of the biggest demands we've gotten from our community is the ability to host low cost air quality sensing data. So we are not 
launching low cost sensors ourselves, but rather saying um, for low cost sensing initiatives out there that want to share their data in a harmonized way alongside both other low cost sensing initiatives, as well as these other government sources um, that, that we're, we're building a pilot platform to, to do that. And one of the hopes is that this helps fill in those data gaps in regions where there's not government monitoring or there's not uh, open sharing of that data by the government yet. Um, and we're always working on various tools and light visualizations that help the community do more. We ourselves aren't building an app or sort of an end product, but rather building the tooling infrastructure that helps others do more with the data. So for example, we're working on a data averaging tool that averages spatially uh, and temporally uh, in our system so that you can get back the air quality average uh, daily value in, in Beijing as opposed to the hourly level uh, at the station level, which is what our raw system provides now. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll close out. I'll say if you would like to get involved in our community or want to hear more, um, we would love uh, for you to uh, reach out to us. I've had my email uh, in the bottom right-hand corner at chrisbedopenaq.org uh, for many of the slides, so please feel free to reach out that way or at info at openaq.org. We also have a public Slack channel um, that I'd invite you all to uh, join as well, where we have a bunch of folks from different sectors who um, uh, share their interests around air inequality uh, or uh, share what they're building on top of the platform or ask questions about how to use the data. Um, so with that, I'll say uh, thank you again for everyone's attention and for uh, the ability to present today. Yeah, thank you. It was a, it's really great. Um, a lot of people in the chat saying wow and clapping along the way. So uh, it's amazing work. Um, so just real quick, wanted to remind everybody who's listening. Um, there is a, a, the way the day works is there is another session, session seven that's starting. So another Crowdcast uh, URL that's starting in a couple minutes. And so uh, check your schedules, check the, the links and um, make sure that you uh, attend different sessions throughout the day. Um, but I do think we have time for one one question. Um, I mean, I, I was just thinking about myself. I work at the University of California and I know there are researchers that use this kind of data to like crunch and analyze against social science and humanities data to like kind of say like, what are the, eff the effects of air quality on you know, ethnographic research or on different things. There's a project out of UC Irvine called the Asthma Files. That's like about trying to bring air quality into the discussion around social science. And so I was just thinking, um, talking a lot about public health, but then also like how the access to this information affects other types of research and like opens up so much more cross-disciplinary research. And I just thought like, you know, it, there, your emphasis is on public health, but I just thought like, are the, what are your thoughts around um, kind of how it affects and how it can affect the social sciences and the humanities as well? Yeah, I think that's a fascinating question. Um, you know, I'm a physical scientist by training, but I think some of the aspects that have captivated me most about seeing how people are using the data or its impact have been around um, more, more of the social science realm. I, I, you know, early on we did a, really light analysis of just seeing how uh, with access to these real-time air quality levels and then if you look at google searches that correspond in various regions during air apocalypses um, how how interest changes or shifts from people googling uh, air pollution versus climate change actually mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i think it's i think it's fascinating to see how folks are motivated to to change and the other thing that i'd point out is you know with the example from beijing um or, or several other examples we've seen it's not that um, the science changed. It's not that the um, it, it, what really changed was the that the way the information was presented to them, to people, to the public, and then the public right. getting activated on the issue. It was the social issue. It wasn't really this sort of technology issue. The data and the yeah. technology that lets that data be shared was was the, I guess the the key thing that needed to be in place. But it's really getting that data in a way that uh, you can let uh, the, the social impacts happen uh, more so than I think anything anything else. Yeah, yeah, I love this um, this trigger event too, that's like um, the Beijing came from, you know, a little bit of uh, either intentional or accidental advocacy by the US embassy there that then sparked this information, you know, ripple effect that created social change. And I think like the, the potential that you're creating with creating that same kind of ripple effect in other communities is amazing. So really great work. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, so um, I think that's it for time. So um, we have the questions for Krista that we'll be moving over to um, Slack. And also slides are up on Zenodo and um, we'll see you in the next session. Thank you.